Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. This is sort of a dream come true for me because I consider Mississippi my adopted home state. I lived here throughout much of the 90s. And uh, my wife's always asking me, why are you so obsessed with Mississippi and Mississippi history? And, and I guess she just has to, to learn more about what some of the things that I've been able to read about and discover. Talking about the Mobile and Ohio Railroad and um, the, it's a, the sociological effects that, um, that, it's, that were um, exhibited on it and that were the results of its existence. I want to start by just taking, giving a brief overview of the history of the railroad, which began very early as a project, as you can see, to bypass the Mississippi River and get freight and eventually passengers between Mobile and St. Louis and on to Chicago. And so it passes through extreme eastern Mississippi and then, and then uh, curves over into parts of Alabama. So what's interesting about this is that uh, it was putting together people and groups that had never encountered one another. Northern urban populations, southern rural populations, both through freight and through passenger traffic, encountered one another along this railroad at the various stops and entrepots. And if you'll notice, being in extreme eastern Mississippi, it's along the Alabama frontier. And frontiers are notorious for being places where Banditry and lawlessness can take place because you can cross over jurisdictions. It's easy to, to hop into Alabama and to hop into Mississippi, and they're two different ju jurisdictions, especially when the law enforcement's kind of sparse. So it's an ideal situation for um, uh, bad acting to take place. And uh, as we'll see, it was destroyed in the Civil War. It was rebuilt rather quickly. It was rebuilt by about 1975. It had been in receivership and finally reached St. Louis by 1882. At first, it had just gone to the Ohio River at Columbus, Kentucky, but then it reached St. Louis. So it's in full operation, both passenger-wise and freight-wise at that point. This is an idealized representation uh, once the Gulf Mobile in Ohio took it over in 1940. And the reason I show this is because as a tourist, this is from the archives here, um, as a presentation to tourists, you can see everything being idealized, even about the most rural aspects of the route. We've got the, what's now the, um, the uh, Naval Air Station, or, uh, and uh, I wonder if it doesn't show Columbus here, and it's got uh, all the beautiful and wonderful things you're going to encounter in Mississippi along this railroad. Uh, fishing, you've got the lake up here, you've got all sorts of uh, attractions that take place, even golf down there. Um, this is a quotation from a book published by the railroad in 1940. And it points out that black Americans were attracted to the railroad as an employment avenue in, uh, in, um, starting in the 1870s because it was seen as a secure, steady job and that the working conditions were better than they were in the fields, so it attracted black Americans as railroad employees, this railroad and others, the Southern Railroad, the Memphis and Charleston, all the others. And so over time, it became known throughout the state that the railroad had a tendency to uh, employ a lot of black people very early on. And this gets kind of ingrained and inculcated into the culture. Lots of labor unrest around 1918 and 1919, which we'll touch on when we go to our maps. There's lots of conflict. People come back from World War I. The, the, the Spanish flu, the influenza epidemic had just happened. And all of a sudden, the white workers within the unions want the black workers terminated. They want to take those jobs and push people aside because they assume that they, they deserve these jobs. So something changes, and all of a sudden, there's more animosity placed on top of what had been there before. And as you see, violence starts to happen within the employment ranks of the railroad. This is the GMO internal memo at a board meeting, admitting that the railroad itself had become a conduit for violence in various ways. And as you see, um, uh, Murder starts taking place, um, attacks. Uh, the railroad itself is saying, we've got to back away from this. We've got to uh, 
not identify ourselves with this sort of violence that's taking place along our line. And by this point, the vi as you'll see, the violence is in and around the railroad itself. It had been endemic. This is not a statistical study, and the things I'm about to show, the incidents I'm about to show you are not caused by the railroad and not necessarily associated with the railroad, but I want to point out the proximity, the propinquity that, that takes place when we see um, the conflicts that happen. We all know these two, and that's not my term, that's Albert Kerwin's term from his 1955 book. And they reflect, as everyone in this room knows, a consciousness that started to arise, let's say in the 1890s, 1893 Constitution in Mississippi, there starts to be a radical populist component within the state that takes control of the state over the old guard, over the people, McLaren, uh, Longino, all these people, I hope I'm pronouncing names correctly, Longino, um, correctly, they take over the state. And I always say there's a reflection of fairly current politics in this, that this reflects right here a vast swath of political and racial sentiment within the state, and perhaps even outside this room. So, these two are very popular, Vardaman and Bilbo. I, I didn't even put their, well, I, I didn't even put captions because I knew you'd know who they were. Um, are extremely po popular in eastern Mississippi, where the parts of eastern Mississippi, parts of parts of eastern Mississippi where we're going to go through here. Stations as entrepots. I'm sure that, uh, you know how when you get out of an airplane and you land and you come out of the gate and people with the signs and the hugs and, and things of that nature. There are places where you meet a strange environment and you also meet acquaintances. There are portals and interstices where we enter a new world. And this is a, uh, we can think of like an information superhighway, the internet itself. These rails were in essence like the internet of their time because they allow people, as I mentioned, St. Louis, Chicago, Mobile, people in freight moving through areas that um, had experienced profound violence, profound animosity, and a lot of unsolved grudges throughout this, this whole area that bubbled up with the catalyst of the railroad coming through. Now, that, that's Waynesboro, um, and uh, I believe that's Shibuta, and then that's Shibuta, and, and then that's, um, that's actually... Uh, on the Delta, I think that's the Cleveland station, but I, I thought it looked good, so I kept it. Um, you see people waiting, people uh, loitering, the trains coming in, it's bringing people that have probably never seen the place before, and it's also uh, putting people together. So we'll take a look at the railroad itself as it comes down. Green means lynching, Blue is other, usually like a murder or some other event, and orange means riot. And I'm not going to go through all these, they're in the paper necessarily. But as you see, right at the top, um, this, is a, this area, let's say starting about here, is a very white area going north. So if you're black and you're coming through here, you are, uh, you, you're, you're isolated and you stand out. So uh, Corinth, riots, lynchings all over. A lot of that's because you get traffic coming through on the Memphis and Charleston and north and south, residual conflict and um, uh, uh, memories, let's say, of the Battle of Corinth, the Siege of Corinth, which killed a lot of people in Corinth, including my ancestor, one of my ancestors, William Peleg Rogers, was there. And um, going on down, you see uh, things start happening related to the railroad itself. People start getting uh, hanged from railroad trestles. People start getting attacked on the railroad itself as almost a symbolic uh, vestment of uh, a remnant of um, the, the resentment that was felt by people at this railroad coming through and at the acculturation that was taking place as a result of it. And we see that um, Will Brown here is, is tied to, in Rienzi, tied to a railroad trestle coming down. This is an anonymous murder here. And um, we start to get into the heart of things here. You see all these lynchings that take place. You see the riots that take place, some of them w m much more well-known than others. And surprisingly, Aberdeen is a center of lynching activity and all sorts of, of violence that takes place there. Here's a spur. Here's a, a, a side rail that comes out to an extremely white area here. 
So this is an area where there's a lot of um, uh, attacks, lynch. There's, there's one here. See this one in Van Fleet? That was a young man on a telephone talking to somebody on the other, and it was purported that he was talking to a white woman and it said some things that were a little bit uh, risque. Nobody heard anything. Nobody knew who was on the other line, but they lynched him. And there's all sorts of st little stories that are behind this that are in the paper. Four young men, quote, put a rat in a well. So they were, that was a group lynching there. Dark red means more than one person being killed at one time. And um, as you see, the spur going down into what's called what, what the, the Black Belt, the Prairie area, where we start to get a predominantly black population starting uh, up, up into Chickasaw, Ch Chickasaw, right in here, starts to get more black. So um, the, um, as we'll see in a little bit, the tables t turn a little bit because, again, it's after, a lot of this is after Reconstruction. So here we have the, the Artesia riots that take place, uh, black Americans rising up, and this, this is very important because it was a, um, uh, one of the first instances of a violent fight back at this particular time. Um, it was possible for people to be armed at this point, and that's what happened in Artesia. It was possible for black Americans to, um, to have fortifications and ammunition and things like that that they didn't necessarily have before. Columbus, of course, being a, a highly agricultural area, as well as a, as a conduit, a lot of interchange here that happens, as well out to Starkville. I hope I said that right, Vol, not Ville. And uh, <laughs> we, we get a, a, some activity out here uh, uh, near and, and around the college. So, um, well, what would have, uh, would have been the college there? So we've got down into Brooksville, and I noticed that in Casey's newspaper presentation, there was a lynching in Brooksville that was just uh, on, off to the side. That's how common these things were. So we get down into Macon and here, and we start to get into the epicenter of violence that's taking place. And we've got um, Macon, uh, Red Summer, which was a riot. We've got another riot immediately post-Reconstruction. And we've got, of course, the lynchings here, murders along the line in Brooksville. So uh, this... Uh, Red Summer is related to the labor unrest that I referenced before in the book that was published by the um, Mobile, Mobile in Ohio itself. We get down into the absolute core of what's happening here, and um, uh, we see the infamous Bloody Kemper incident in 1906, which perhaps is perhaps the most violent racial incident to, to take place in Mississippi ever. And I'm sure... Uh, uh, I wanted to deal with the, the less known incidents, but I do want to cover this because it happened on the train, a quarrel between Jim, Jim Simpson and his brother and a conductor, somebody on the train. There was a stabbing, and it was discovered. And when, they, when that train stopped in Wahalak, the two men were pulled off the train, summarily lynched. As it progressed to Scuba, the white population finds out that this, this had happened here, this violence had happened on the train, and it becomes open warfare, open armed warfare takes place in Scuba, in between Scuba and Wahalak. And, um, and the governor, Governor Vardaman, decides to send the National Guard. He sends a train up from Meridian. I think they sent some across the Southern Railway, Railway from Jackson. The, Nash, the, the Mississippi militia, let's say, gets there, and they turn around because the populace, the Vardaman, the, 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 um, the Vardaman supporting populace is not sufficiently respectful of them. They're not calling him sir. They're not being polite to them. So they turn around. The violence and warfare continues in Scuba. Hundreds of people die. And in, this is a unique situation because black Americans were able to defend themselves with weapons and fortifications and actually hold their own in this open war that took place in 1906. Come down through here, you've got a um, uh, similar conflict that takes place in this little zone here. This, this is probably the most violent zone on all my maps. And um, of course, Meridian, there's uh, uh, the famous Brown versus Mississippi case takes place. Uh, the, The situation itself took place in Kemper County, but the trial was moved to Meridian. Three young men were accused of killing a, a, um, 
a white, uh, actually the son of a white farmer, and the confessions were beaten out of them. And this uh, trial took place in Meridian and um, uh, with a well-known district attorney, and they got three defense attorneys, three public defenders, to defend these three young, three young men. They just sat there. They didn't do anything to defend. One of the public defenders had a pang of conscience, or he just something he couldn't sleep about it, and it ended up being taken to the Mississippi Supreme Court, and um, where there was only one dissent, by the way, and then to the United States Supreme Court, which a case was decided in 1936 that tortured confessions and beatings are not admissible in, uh, when, when obtaining a confession. So that's, that's a famous one that took place, again, uh, right along the railroad. And I always come back to the railroad because uh, in an extremely rural region, that's the only interchange that, that you're going to have with other people. This is the, the mode of transportation. The automobile is, of course, used quite prominently at this point, but this area is known as and for the uh, Mobile and Ohio pass-through. And um, uh, memories of northerners passing through, memories of uh, conflicts that had, smaller conflicts that had taken place along all those stations I talked, kind of built up here. Get down into the southeast, this is a very white area down here. The, probably the second most famous thing that's on here is the Hanging Bridge incident where four very young uh, black people were killed, lynched, hung from the railroad bridge. Like a lot of these are hanging from trestles and bridges themselves. People are so, they're, they're projecting their animosity onto the railroad itself, their anger and violence and using it as a symbol. And uh, this was a, uh, this is of course front page of the New York Times at the time, so it's not as, as uh, unknown. There was another lynching here in 1942, uh, right along the railroad there. And when you look up Shibuda in the, in the in Wikipedia, that comes up. It's like it's associated with it. By the way, when I was doing research about the um, Bloody Kemper incident, I had someone that I was going to interview, you might know him, Casey, of him. and. Um, I was all excited. I was going to find out all, all the information about this because he's so knowledgeable. I ask him about it, and he doesn't know anything about this incident. All of a sudden, he just had forgotten everything about it. So that just goes to show you, even at this time, the unwillingness of people along this line to, uh, to even address it. Do you remember when I talked about um, the outlawry that's happened? This is a famous outlaw gang that were actually from Alabama, from up here toward actually up toward Aliceville. And they're using the frontier, just like people did in the, in the Brown versus Mississippi incident, to go back and forth and get in between jurisdictions where the sheriff's not able to get them. And almost all of these cases, you have a situation where there's a mob and there's a sheriff's department, and they're racing each other to either get the conviction and the quick execution or the lynching itself. So the law, so to speak, is racing against time before the mob actually gets there with basically the same goal in mind in most cases. So these, these guys who are white were able to take advantage of this back and forth throughout their careers as outlaws. This is the lyrics of a song by Blind Lemon Jefferson. He's not from Mississippi, but this is one of the few blues songs written about lynching. And I want you to notice something. In this song, the person is not only guilty, but he knows it, and he's sort of re repentant about being guilty, and almost asks for forgiveness. Now, none of the situations I describe or map are like this, but this, this was, and again, this was for commercial consumption. This was recorded on a vinyl record in, uh, I think, in, in uh, Texas. So, Blind Lemon Jefferson thought in order to present the topic of lynching in song commercially, he had to make it like the person's guilty and, oh, I'm so repentant, and all these things are happening. So it wasn't even possible within the context of blues lyrics in 1928 to express the sentiment that black people were feeling about what was happening along, along this railroad along throughout the South. This, 1976, this is the Ohio Players, uh, recording a song that I didn't even know existed till I started doing this research, talking about how violent and intimidating East Mississippi is 
to visitors and how you have to watch yourself, 1976. And it's specifically about Far East Mississippi. It's specifically about this right along the MO Railroad. So even at this point, you've got um, fear. These, these young men were probably told by their grandparents. It probably just filtered through family history. You know that somebody here actually had an experience there, and they felt like they needed to record something about it in the 70s. And um, I haven't been keeping track of time. I didn't want to go soon, but that's, that's my presentation right there. Thank you so much for having me. Where my magic wand went. Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you all for having me today. Um, I know I'm the last before lunch, um, and you're all very hungry, so I'm going to uh, try, try to go quickly. <laughs> um, my name is um, Kate Gregory. I am the director of the Mississippi Political Collections um, at Mississippi State University Libraries, um, and if you are, like, I've uh, never heard of that, you're probably in good company. Um, we are the artist formerly known as the Congressional and Political Research Center. Um, we changed our name last year uh, just to be a little bit more um, aligned with what peer institutions um, are doing um, and also just to be a little bit more direct about who we are, where we are, what our collecting focus is, and that is definitely um, Mississippi. Um, and another thing, Two, um, while the congressional collections that we have are no doubt the um, cornerstones um, of our holdings, um, we have worked particularly over the last decade to broaden out um, what the definition of politics and political means in terms of collecting um, and the types of individuals and groups whose records we uh, try to go out and, and get and preserve. Um, so uh, one of those collections I'm going to talk about today, and that's the papers of Judge William Cady. There we go. Okay. Um, so just to tell you a little bit more um, about the MPC, um, we are about 25 years old. Um, these are our... Uh, most notable, most recognizable collections here um, are our congressional collections, the papers of Senator John Stennis, who we've heard a little bit about this morning already, um, Congressman Sonny Montgomery, between the two of them, and they're both Mississippi State alums, between the two of them, um, they served a total of 71 years in Congress, um, and we also of course, have the papers of our friend, Congressman David Bowen, who's right here down front. <laughs> We're happy to see him today. Um, and then Congressman um, Mike Espy, whose papers are really valuable to us. Um, he uh, became the first um, black Secretary of Agriculture in American history in the uh, Bill Clinton administration. Um, we are about to open, the and at the end of this month, the papers of Congressman Chip Pickering, who followed Sonny Montgomery uh, in Congress and serving the Mississippi's third congressional district. Um, and he was there about 12 years. We also, um, and this collection is closed right now, but we are the home of uh, Senator Marsha Blackburn's papers, a uh, senator from Tennessee, but she is actually a native of Mississippi um, and a graduate of Mississippi State. So that's just sort of an overview um, of who we are and, and what we have. Um, oh, oh, wrong way. All right. Um, so talking a bit about our judicial collections and, again, broadening out this idea of what it means to be a political collection. Um, one of the things that I think is really obvious um, about judges is even though there's a, you know, ongoing philosophical debate about the intersection of politics and the law, you know, I think for our purposes, you can't ignore the fact that judges are um, political appointees or they're either elected. Um, and I think when you think about politics in the framework of public service, judges fit really, really well within the scope of what we are collecting. 
Um, and then as far as g judicial collections, federal judicial collections, which is um, what Judge Katie was, um, there is a lot of demonstrated research value in these collections. And um, there's one really great um, article that came out um, in the NYU Law Review um, by the uh, lawyer Catherine Watts, and there have been several um, articles kind of in response to this paper um, talking about the value of federal judicial records. Um, and this has been some pretty recent scholarship over the last 10 years. Um, the, the most recent came out in, in 2018 or 2019, I think. So there is um, an active ongoing discourse within the legal uh, community about the value of these collections. Um, and I think that that's really interesting and just one example of why it's so important that we preserve these papers and pay a lot of attention to them. And then another thing that's presented a challenge for us is there really aren't a lot of good guidelines for archivists out there dealing with the records of federal judges. Um, the Society of American Archivists uh, posted uh, something on their website, like what they call an issue brief. Um, which just a committee of members of SAA, you know, sort of put together offering a very brief assessment of what is best practice with uh, federal judicial archives um, and resources that are out there. And one of the best ones um, is the Federal Judicial Center's Guide to the Preservation of Judges' Papers. It's, um, it's on its second edition. I think they're about to put out a third edition. They may have done it already. Um, but it's about uh, an 86-page document that is, it, it is really helpful um, in terms of offering, you know, what to keep, what not to keep, how to arrange it, how to describe it, things like that. Uh, I keep going the wrong way. My bad. Um, so uh, some of the challenges for archivists dealing with political papers um, that I think are unique, um, I mean, this, this is true, I think, for all kinds of records, but I think particularly true for the types of records that we have. One of the biggest challenges with political collections um, is something that we call intellectual control. Um, and my archivists in the room are like, yeah, I know what you're talking about, <laughs> you know. Um, and so what intellectual control really means is just your ability as an archivist, um, as the staff, the people tasked with stewarding the collection, to know what's in there, right? What it's about, what it contains, how it's arranged, um, and be able to locate and find that material for the user. Um, and when you're dealing with political collections, they're notoriously humongous. Um, and, and these days, they're still big, but they're, they're coming in the form of you know, hard drives and jump drives and, and data, but it's still a ton of data, big, big data. Um, and I think the intellectual control of that is still going to continue to be um, a, a challenge for us. Um, but that is something that really has guided how I have approached processing Judge Katie's papers. It's just how can I get a handle, a better handle, on what is actually here and what we can offer to our, our researchers. Um, there's also um, an idea here um, by a couple of archivists um, that was offered in, in 2005 um, in the Society of American Archivists publication, um, the American Archivist. Um, and it's about 20 years old now, but it has become a pretty seminal text for archivists. And it's also highly controversial. <laughs> um, people feel um, a, a, across a wide spectrum of feelings about it. Uh, but these are sort of the tenets of it. Um, the idea is to find ways um, new ways, any means necessary, to get collections into the hands of users. Um, and then also, you know, you want to make sure that they're arranged, what they say, adequately. Um, I think some people take issue with that because a adequate, it sort of implies good enough to get by. Um, and that's not always the best. It's not always ideal. 
Um, the, the last two here, um, I think, are the ones that I take <laughs> the most quibble with, um, taking minimum steps necessary for physically preserving materials. Um, that, you know, that can be dangerous in the long run uh, because there are certain things that, you know, they may not be old now, but they're going to be old, <laughs> you know, um, and it, it can be hard when you call something done generations go on, time goes on, projects get forgotten, and so I think as much physical preservation as you can provide to the materials up front is really important, even if that prolongs the, the process of, of getting the collection open. Um, and then the last thing, describing materials sufficiently for use. Um, this can be really problematic as well, um, as we are sort of learning when we go back through um, old finding aids that were created 20 and 30 years ago, what we find is that um, certain moments, certain people, certain incidents weren't really described accurately or with um, a lot of sensitivity or care um, for the people really affected by it. And one that sticks out in particular to me um, is during the COVID year 2020, just one of the only things that I could do was um, sort of clean up finding aids um, on the computer and I ran into one, um, the papers of Russell Davis, who was the mayor of Jackson. Um, he was mayor uh, when the Jackson State riots happened um, in 1970. In that finding aid, which again at this point is about 30 years old, um, we, we described it as the disturbance at Jackson State. Well, if you remember from that, um, two young kids, two students, were killed uh, by police at that riot. Um, and so going back and fully explaining, fully fleshing out um, the descriptions of a collection is really important. And this is a lot of what I have tried to do with Judge Katie's papers, um, just to improve the, the quality of it. Um, so a little bit about the papers. It's 250 cubic feet. It's the largest federal judicial collection that we have. Um, it contains mostly case files from his career um, as the Northern District Judge. Um, from 1968 to 1989, we've got uh, personal files, tons of correspondence, um, a, a few photographs, some publications. He um, had a real uh, interest in um, genealogy and he has a lot of his own uh, family records in there which I think would be really helpful for certain people um, and the the biggest problem that I saw with it is that it was only partially processed and it had really no finding aid um, that was usable and so rewriting the finding aid getting it online um, was a big goal here and, and still is as I worked through it uh, so a little bit about Judge Katie. He's a really interesting man. Um, he grew up in Greenville, Mississippi. That's where he lived the rest of his life. Um, he went to uh, Washington University in St. Louis for law school. Um, growing up in Greenville, um, you'll, you'll notice in this picture here, um, he actually was born um, without a uh, part of his right arm and he, he wrote a memoir um, called All Rise about his uh, career as a, as a federal judge and in that memoir um, he talks about how that affected his relationship with his parents. He says I, I think my, my parents weren't very proud of me because of that which is as a mom is really heartbreaking. I also think it says a lot um, about you know, our understanding of people with disabilities and how far we've come from the time that he was born in, in 1913. Um, and so I think because of two things, um, what uh, seemed to be a fairly distant relationship with his parents, um, and also the fact that they both died when he was really young, um, he becomes really, really, really close friends um, with the Percy family in Greenville. Um, William Percy, Walker Percy, the, the writers, um, William Percy, author of Lanterns on the Levee, I'm sure you guys are familiar with them, 
Um, they were lawyers by trade. Um, and so when he comes out of law school, he actually goes to work for their law firm there in Greenville. He gets interested in democratic politics and he actually serves um, six years in the state legislature, one term in the House um, and two terms right after that in the state Senate. He's a delegate to uh, several Democratic national conventions. Um, he says um, in his memoir that uh, he sort of felt like if he was really going to be a good lawyer or a good jurist, he really needed to get away from politics. And that's what he did. Um, he was nominated to the post as a federal district judge by Lyndon B. Johnson um, in 1968. And again, I think this is, of course, that intersection of politics and the law. You have to know that it was his work with the Democratic National Party um, and his public service in the state legislature that had to have contributed a lot to LBJ's decision to um, nominate him. And there's more about this um, in his memoir that he published um, about a year before he died. Um, so these are just some of the research strengths of his collection. Um, the, he, he is involved in several um, civil rights cases, and there's one in particular that I'm going to talk about today. Um, but school desegregation cases, um, reforms to Parchman, um, several freedom of speech cases on college campuses at Ole Miss, Mississippi State, I think one at Southern Miss, um, and uh, one pretty big case surrounding um, funding for the completion of the 10 Tom Waterway, um, which uh, Mississippi State is also the home of the 10 Tom Waterway papers. Um, if you're interested in that. So the, the big case, kind of his landmark case that he is nationally known for is um, Gates versus Collier. Um, and I, I knew a little bit about who Judge Katie was, but not a ton um, really about his rulings. And one day um, I had just got finished driving my kids to school and I was listening to this great podcast from the Washington Post that's called Constitutional, and each episode um, sort of breaks down each, um, like, amendment, um, just, g it goes in order, and each one, it camps out for about an hour and talks with historians and lawyers and, and that sort of thing to talk about um, the significance of each one, um, and I was on the one about the Eighth Amendment, and that whole episode is about this case. Um, and when I heard about Judge Katie's involvement in it, I just about slammed on my brakes and I was like, oh man, <laughs> what have we got here? Um, and it was really then that I knew um, that this collection had a really unique uh, story to tell, definitely had a ton of public interest, and we really needed to uh, start spending time on getting it processed and getting the finding aid online where researchers could use it. Um, so, over the course of this case, um, he visits Parchman four times, and of course he, he's from the Delta, I'm sure he knows a good bit about it, uh, but at, you know, at this point I'm not you know, here to give a history of Parchman, but we know that um, into the early 1970s, um, Parchman remained segregated, um, and as with you know, everything that was segregated at that time, it was separate, but it was certainly not equal. Um, and nowhere was that more true than at Parchman. Um, what happened is that during um, the Civil Rights Movement, there was a lawyer, his name I can't remember, uh, but I think he came from maybe Washington, D.C. Um, he had spent a good bit, bit of time in Mississippi in the 60s, um, and he had actually spent a good bit of time at Parchman, um, going through the prison, interviewing the prisoners, and um, really could see that there was a, a strong case here. Um, and he convinced uh, this man, uh, Nazareth Gates, and a handful of others, and they actually filed what became a class action lawsuit um, against the state of Mississippi. 
um, and that's what this case ended up being. Uh, so Judge Katie, you know, in sort of the judicial review process, um, determines immediately just how absolutely unacceptable the conditions at Parchman are. And so I've just put a few quotes from his final ruling on the case and how he describes the conditions there. And he orders the state of Mississippi to clean up its act. Um, and, and they do, um, although, you know, we, as we have seen now and in recent years, um, there, there is uh, Jay-Z, right, uh, has funded a lawsuit um, against Parchman. And so it's, you know, we're having this conversation yet again. Um, but this, at, this is really the moment at which Parchman becomes integrated, and it also um, abolishes, this case abolishes the system called the trustee system, which I'm sure several of you are familiar with, but it was this practice where um, rather than prison officials, um, you know, directing the inmates, um, they, would, they would give control of black inmates to the white inmates, and that led to a lot of violence um, and really just brutal practices that just could no longer stand. Um, so this is just a little bit more about um, the, the impact of Gates and what, you know, sort of the legal application of it here and Judge Katie's argument. Um, basically, that it's in violation of the Eighth Amendment's prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment. Um, and he says, We're, we just can't do that anymore. Um, another thing it does provides um, adequate square footage. They didn't have that. No, no more work in fields. Um, you know, we, we sort of chuckle, and I'm sure um, you guys down here at NBAH get this a good bit too. People will email in, and they will ask for, like, photos of slavery. We don't really have those <laughs> for obvious reasons. And what they're really thinking about um, when they think those exist are images of Parchman Farm. Um, and so you know, just those images of the, the work, the hard work, the brutality of work in fields, um, that's really parchment that you're seeing, and that's what this brings to an end. Um, there's a medical historian um, at NYU who uh, wrote a, a book, a, a good book, a history of uh, Parchman Prison, um, and he says that this case effectively ended slavery. He says that the, the conditions at Parchman up to 1972 when Judge Katie rules in this case was the last vestige of slavery in the South, which is bananas to think about in 1972, um, how long this went on. Um, this is another uh, quote here that I heard at the end of that podcast, and it, it really did make me think, you know, this is important. Um, it says, how we treat the most vulnerable citizens in our polity says volumes about our national character. Um, and I thought that that was a really powerful way of, of looking at this case um, and definitely sums up what I think is the significance of this collection. Um, so, sort of my, my plans for this collection, um, obviously, get the darn thing all the way online. Um, and once I've done that, um, I want to try to, you know, find ways to integrate this collection um, into our um, graduate and undergraduate courses that we work with on a regular basis. Civil rights history, um, civil rights law, we have a really good pre-law um, program. We, have, we also have a great political science and public administration program that does a lot uh, um, with our archives and we, we uh, hope to get more, you know, more of our judicial collections um, in their hands as well, as well as African American studies. Um, and then uh, making exhibits, we um, have the Omeka um, digital exhibit system that we just started using about three years ago. Um, I think that, you know, some documents from this case um, would be a great 
you know, exhibit for, for, for Omeka um, and also develop some more exhibits around that. Uh, just about just the, the federal judiciary and some sort of things you don't really know about that. So um, that's really, those are my receipts. That's about all I got for today. So now you can eat. <laughs>